scary stories. When I was in grade school, my family lived in a house that sat directly across from the school I attended. However, there was about a half a mile of wooded area between them. I was allowed to walk to and from school because it was so straightforward. My mother informed me that she and her siblings walked through the woods to school when they were younger, so it felt like a natural and safe thing for her. I loved the excitement of being able to walk to school all on my own, and I felt pretty at home in the woods as I had been raised around them. The walk was pretty direct, with little issues aside from a small but wide creek that I had to cross. The creek itself was no problem. It was the fact that on each side there was a steep bank that had to be scaled. It wasn't too terrible unless it had been raining. It had rained that day before, so my steps, which were normally loud, were fairly silent. This might have saved my life. It at least saved me from something terrible. When I reached the creek, I was in my own little world. I was thinking about a science project we had to do at school, and rather or not, I was fully prepared for my part in it. I was doing the supernova section and wasn't feeling very ready to make a speech in front of everyone explaining it. Anyway, I reached the creek and dropped down the first bank with a slightly wet thud. I crossed over the water and began looking for something to grab a hold of to pull myself up. There were usually roots sticking out to use. Before I could climb up the other side, I heard a noise, like people talking. I stopped and waited to see if I could hear it again. I did. I heard a couple of boys talking, getting closer to me. I smashed myself up against the bank and listened for a minute. I don't know why, but something just told me to stay away, that something was wrong. The boys came so close, all the way to the edge of the creek bank, but they didn't jump down. If they had, they would have seen me in a flash. As luck would have it, there was an overhang that I was able to hide under. I listened as the boys talked. Yeah, she comes through here all the time. She'd be coming around in just a minute. My heart sank. I was the only person that walked this trail to and from school, and they were in my direct path. That isn't to say that no one else was ever in the woods, but in all the time I used this trail, I'd never seen another person. To get to the woods from my house, I had to cross the road and walk through a small flat area with no trees, and from the school side, I had to walk through the school's football field. Anyone from either side could have seen me going in and out of the woods easily. I stood plastered to the wall of mud, waiting for them to catch me, but they walked around for a little bit, smoked a couple of cigarettes, and started to get frustrated. Where the hell is this bitch, man? You said she'd be here. So where the fuck is she? Maybe she isn't coming to school today. Anyway, we gotta go, or we're gonna miss our bus. The high schoolers caught their bus to the high school at the elementary school. This told me two things. One, they were obviously in high school, so much older than me, and two, they had some seriously bad intentions towards me. I heard them leaving, but I didn't dare move. I waited a good 30 minutes or so before I darted out of the creek bed and toward home. I will never know exactly what those two boys had planned to do to me that day, and I'm not sure I want to know. This happened a couple of years ago, and it's time to get it off of my chest. I was around 18, and for a period of time, I was very physically active. I had struggled with some bad habits brought by excessive partying and exercise proved very helpful in this regard. I regularly went jogging. Mind you, at the time, I lived in a small town in the ever so peaceful Scandinavia, out all by myself jogging in the woods, not a soul in sight, right? So my class didn't start until around noon, so I went out for a morning jog, broad daylight and everything. I went on my bike to the tracks, left my bike at the jogging station. It was a small red cottage where different outdoor clubs hung out. As I am about to enter the tracks, there are two middle-aged men sitting by the cottage. I glanced over them, only to find myself locking eyes with one of them. The way he looked at me 
was deeply unsettling. It was only for a moment, but I'll never forget how I felt when his eyes pierced right through me. My gut is making an honest effort trying to tell me that something is off about this whole situation. These men are wearing jeans and leather jackets. They sure aren't here for exercise. But I brush it off, thinking I'm overreacting. I was wrong. I had only been jogging for a couple of minutes when I suddenly feel like turning around. And there they are, in a white minivan, following me on the tracks. I feel that the man's devilish eyes are on me again. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, 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 no. I'm doing my best, trying to think of a logical, non-threatening reason for them to follow me. I can't really think of one that makes sense, so I'm trying to work out what on earth I'm going to do. I don't want to make it obvious that I'm downright terrified. If I start running as fast as I can, I'm turning myself into prey. No one else is here. No one. It won't matter how loud I scream. Fortunately, I've been on these tracks a number of times, so I know there is going to be a sharp curve not so far away. So I try to act as if I'm not the least bothered by the whole situation. As soon as I pass the curve, I'm out of their vision for a short while. I sprint into the woods as if my life depended on it and hide behind a small rock. I'm crouching down as I see the white vehicle pass a sharp curve. Soon, they are out of my sight, but I dare not move. I know that when they pass the curve and notice I'm nowhere to be seen, they'll know I have run off somewhere. After the curve, the trail is in a straight line for quite some time. They'll know I'm not on the tracks anymore. So I stay put, thinking that if they are after me, they will come back. If I'm overreacting, they'll carry on doing whatever they are doing, and I won't be seeing them again. But the white van came back. At this point, my memory is a bit vague. I won't even breathe, dreading the slightest moment will give me away. I can't fully remember if the van stopped and the dominant man went outside, or if they simply passed the curve again very slowly looking for me. But I do vividly remember the little van went back where it came from. I was somewhat relieved, though still a bit worried. Thing is, all tracks lead back to the cottage where these men are likely to be. I then decided to carry on deeper into the woods, glancing over my shoulder every now and then to make sure no one is there. My sense of direction is somewhat okay when I'm in a forest for some reason. I'm useless otherwise. Anyway, I know that there will be a highway if I just keep on going. I'm reaching the highway and make my way home from there. It usually takes half an hour walking from where I live to the tracks. This journey home took three to four hours. Totally worth it. But I can't remember if I ever went to pick up my bike. I do not know what intentions these men had. I doubt they were good. And I do not know what was in that van. I should have called the police on you, creeps. When I was in my early 20s, I worked as a bank teller for a couple of years before moving on to my current industry. I'd been having a run of self-induced bad dating luck. Self-induced meaning I was choosing fellas that were fast, dirty, and fun while expecting to find long-lasting love. There was this one guy who was a manager of a local country western style high club that did their banking business with the bank I worked at. That was not my type and totally opposite of the kind of fellas I had been going for. When he started coming inside the bank for the club's deposits, we had some fun back and forth banter that led to flirting over some weeks. Well, he eventually asked me out on a date and I thought the hell with it. He's witty and I really enjoyed talking to him. So I said yes, clearly my normal type wasn't working out for me. I was gun shy after my failed dating experience, so I suggested lunch to keep things light and casual. He asked if he could still pick me up, and as a sucker for chivalry, I said yes. 
So he picked me up from the bank's front parking lot. In hindsight, I realized what a bad career decision it was to date a bank customer, let alone get in a car with him right in front of the building. 30-year-old me would kick my 20-something-year-old in the ass. The front parking lot was for customers only. The back lot was for employees only. The back lot had three rows, with the third being furthest away from the bank. You probably had to walk 50 yards or so from the back door of the bank to the third row where I parked. Things seemed totally fine when I got in the car with him. It was pretty typical in terms of awkwardness considering it was the first date. He drove me to a pub slash grill downtown and that's when things started to get weird. When we sat down, it was like some other dude took over his body. He started telling me about his most recent breakup and ex-girlfriend, how she ended up being a psycho, she stalked him, took out a restraining order against him, caused him to lose his job, broke his heart, the works, on and on and on and on. I really don't think I said more than 10 words the entire time, and some of those were to order my food. He talked about his drama the entire time. So I'm sitting there across the table from Motormouth, and he suddenly says, we should cut the date short so I can get back to the bank in time. He says it will take us too long to get back if we don't leave now. The ride back, he was dead silent until we pulled back into the parking lot. He tells me he had an amazing time and that he hopes we can do it again. Now I'm fully aware people can get super nervous on first dates and that many people struggle from social anxiety. So I'm not totally out at this point. I gave the dude my number, then thanked him for lunch, and went back inside feeling overwhelmed and very puzzled. We were not allowed to have our cell phones out at the bank, so I put it where I always did, inside my bag. That was inside my locked teller cabinet. I took a break later that afternoon, and when I checked my phone, had well over 20 missed calls and text after text after text after text from this guy. He started out sweet and then when I didn't answer his calls or nice texts deteriorated into downright nuts. Why aren't you answering me? Is it over already? Should I come to the bank so we can talk etc. I was freaked but at work so I just threw my phone back in my bag and tried to shake it off. I was mentally beating myself up for my bad choices for the rest of the day. When the bank had closed that evening, I locked up my teller drawer and walked out to my car. There was a single rose tucked in my windshield wiper. I yanked my phone out of my bag and the last text I had from him said, I hope you like your surprise. I didn't drive my car to meet this guy for our date. He picked me up in the customer parking lot. I got to work every day an hour before opening. There's no way he could have known what I drove without doing some serious detective work. I snatched the rose off of the car, threw it down, and got the fuck out of there fast. I drove around in circles before I went home because I was scared of being followed. I blocked his number. He didn't come back in the lobby again after that day. He started going through the drive-up window. A few months later after we hadn't seen him for a while. One of the other club employees told us he had been fired for stealing money. I never told anyone at the bank about it, especially my boss. Sure makes me wonder about all of those stories he told me about his ex on the lunch date. Told my current boyfriend this story a year or two ago and he thinks the guy had probably been watching me for a while before he asked me out and that's how he knew which car was mine. I'll never know. I graduated from high school in 2009 and a couple of friends decided that we should go camping. Funny enough, I almost didn't go because my friend Derek was dating a girl named Brittany and he wanted to bring her along. I could not stand her. She came from a family with money and had a nice body, blah blah blah. I wasn't upset at that. It was her attitude that I'm better than everyone else. Worship me. You know what I mean. 
He was dating her because she was hot. Simple as that. I'm so glad I went. I might not like her, but if I hadn't gone, who knows what would have happened. My Nana always trusted my judgment, so she didn't even worry about me going. Derek's parents knew me and my friend Rachel were going, but not Brittany. His mom wouldn't let us go if she did, because I'm a mom, not an idiot. Rachel's mom was fine with it because I was with her. She actually doesn't like camping, but she had recently broken up with her boyfriend, so I told her that it would help her clear her head. So off we went. Originally, we were going to go to a campsite, but instead we went into the middle of the woods. Yes, me and my friends were dumbasses. Day one was fine. We hung out, ate, and then we had to listen to this loving couple that night. The next morning, I get up and drag Rachel with me to grab wood. By that, I mean she picks it up and I carry all of it. LOL. Suddenly, I get a strange feeling and I hear a branch snap. I turn. There is some guy standing there. I just stare at him and finally he smiles and waves. Rachel and this guy, Adam, hit it off right away. He seems nice enough. I'm feeling a little standoffish, but act friendly. I'm not very trusting of people. He tells us how he and his family have been camping for a couple of weeks and how we should come meet them. Rachel, who is single now and hates it, says, Let's go! Oh, I hate her. Where my friends go, I go. I tell her we should drop off the wood first. Without asking, he follows us back to the campsite. I hear Derek and Brittany having sex. Rachel says, just leave them. So we head over to Adam's campsite. The first thing I notice is the sheer amount of shit around their site. This doesn't look like the site of people staying for a couple of weeks, but months. I don't say anything as he introduces us to his mother, father, and little brother. They were all very friendly and welcoming. Rachel was very happy with all the attention. I should feel happy. No, I'm growing more and more paranoid. The mother and father are being overly touchy and feely. The mother keeps touching my hair, saying how pretty and soft it is, and how she wishes she had hair like mine. I'm named after a bird, and she lovingly gives me the nickname, Pretty Bird. I do not like that name. But I say nothing, just smile. The father isn't much better. He makes a comment about how nice my body is, that it looks real sturdy, says most girls are too thin nowadays. I'm kinda shocked that his wife is saying nothing about this. He asks me to flex my arm. I do, and he starts to feel my arm up. What the hell? I just want to leave at this point. But Rachel keeps gabbing with Adam. I ask about all the trash, etc. laying around, and say, aren't you worried about the bears? The father laughs and says, who no, we have good. Oh, goody. Finally, I'm able to tell her that we should head back. Adam offers to walk us back, but I manage to brush him off. As we are walking, I tell her I don't like any of them. Well, the little brother was okay, but the rest, ugh. She tells me I'm just being paranoid, and that I just hate them because they are nice. Not everyone that acts nice has an ulterior motive. I'm livid. I tell him, stop thinking with your clit, and that there is much more to life than cock. Yeah, it wasn't a good walk back. I am so pissed at this point. I tell Derek that we are sharing a tent. Brittany starts to argue with me, but I gave her the scary eyes, as Derek puts it, so I sleep with him that night. I was going to talk to him about the family, but he passed out before I could. The next morning, Rachel and Brittany aren't talking to me. Which I'm fine with. Honestly, I just want to get this trip over with and go home. That's when Adam randomly shows up. He says his family is making a late breakfast. I don't want to go. So, of course, we all go. We eat. And I don't bother to hide the fact that I'm irritable. But I couldn't say no to the little brother when he asked me if I would play checkered with him. After a while, Derek and Brittany head back to the campsite so we can take her to Frisco Town. Rachel says, I don't have to wait for her. I tell her, I'm staying just to spite her. After a while, I hint that we should go, but she keeps ignoring me. Adam hands me an open soda at one point, asking me if I want it. I say, no thanks. I do not drink open sodas from strangers. But Rachel does, of course. It gets worse. The mother brings out beer. What? I tell her, we're underage. She says, she's not that much of a hard ass that she lets the boys drink a little sometimes. I say no thanks. 
Rachel doesn't. Rachel is a tiny little thing, so it doesn't take much for her to get drunk. But I can tell it's different this time. Something is very, very wrong here. I tell them we should go. I grab her and notice she's having a hard time moving. I put her on my back so I can piggyback her. The mother actually says she can stay here for the night. I say it's the best if she sticks with us. They keep pushing it, and I was suddenly worried they wouldn't let us leave. Finally, I'm able to leave. Not even halfway there, Rachel is passed out. Oh my god. Can they roofie her? When I get back, I put Rachel in her tent and tell Derek I need to talk to him. He grumbles at me, but comes out. I let it all out. At first, he thinks I'm just being overprotective, paranoid self. But when I say that he must have noticed in the booze and the fact that Rachel is passed out, it sinks in. He asks me what we should do. I tell him it's too late to do anything right now. We'll head out tomorrow. I tell him that we'll make some excuse and not to tell Rachel or Brittany. They will both say I'm paranoid and will fight us. We go to bed and don't sleep well. The next morning we wake up and wait for the girls to get up. Finally they do. As we are drinking some coffee, I ask Rachel if she's okay. She says yeah. Just feels tired and she doesn't remember anything after drinking. After sitting around for a little while, I tell them that Derek's dad wants us to come home a little early. Brittany is happy. Rachel is not. She asks if we could postpone it a little longer. I say no. He really needs us back. I tell them we should pack today. Suddenly, I notice Derek staring behind me. I turn and walking out of the woods is Adam. He wants us all to come over and Rachel mentions that I want us to pack because we have to leave. He acted very disappointed and asked if we can stay a little longer. I say no. After a while, I tell Derek to go ahead to their campsite without me. I'll pack up some of the stuff myself. I don't want him knowing we have the care of heart. When they leave, I get most of the personal shit in the car but leave the camping stuff out. When I get to their site, I can tell that Derek wants to leave. I mentioned that we should get to the bed early because we have to leave early. Rachel says we should just leave later in the day. I say no. When she keeps arguing with me, I pull out the big guns. I'll call your mom if you don't stop fighting with me. I didn't want to use that, but I have to get her away from this freak show. Suddenly, sweet, funny Adam snaps. He gets in my face and says I'm not her mother and that I can't tell her what to do. I get right in his face and tell him to back off. The father calms things down by saying that friends shouldn't fight. After that we leave. Rachel is in tears and won't speak to me. I feel like shit. I figured me and Derek can tell her when we leave why I've been acting like an ass. I sleep with Derek that night. I pass out cold. I think I can sleep well because I'll never have to see the family again. I wake up, which isn't that strange because I have always had trouble staying asleep. But that's why I woke up. It's because I can hear someone walking around the campsite. I wake up Derek. I whisper to him that I think the family isn't happy about us leaving. He is freaked, and so am I. We get dressed as quickly as we can. I grab the mini shovel, and he grabs the hatchet. I tell him we need to run as soon as I get the girls up. I slowly open the tent. I look out. I can't see anything in the moonlight. I slowly crawl out and open the girls' tents. I wake them both up and order them to get dressed. Brittany starts to loudly yell at me, but I cover her mouth. I tell them we will talk about this later when we get out of here, but right now they needed to listen to me. Derek peeks in and says he has the keys. The girls get dressed. As we half crouch out of the tent, when they are ready, I tell Brittany to not let go of Rachel's hand no matter what. As we start to stand, I hear a noise by the fire pit. It's the father, and he has something in his hand. Are oh, you leaving already? I say, run. As we are running, I'm behind Rachel trying to watch the sides while Derek has the front. All I can hear is everyone's desperate gasping, the sound of the underbrush crunching, and the yelling behind us. Brittany tries to stop running to say something to me. I tell her to just keep running, but her stalking causes Rachel to stumble and I grab her so she doesn't fall. Instead it causes me to fall. I eat shit 
I hit the ground, tits first, so hard, it knocked the wind out of me. I hear Rachel yell my name, but I wheeze out to keep running. They run ahead as I try and get up, but my head is spinning. My left titty took the worst hit. I grab my chest as I try and find the mini shovel I dropped. I can't find it, so I grab a sharp rock and keep running. I feel like the forest is closing in on me, like the moonlight can't even reach me. And I think, I'm gonna die here. Finally, I see the car. Everyone is standing outside. Rachel starts screaming when she sees me. I yell to get in the car. They all dive in, and I do when I get close enough. My chest is on fire. As Derek starts the car, Rachel and Brittany scream. On my side of the car, behind us is Adam. Derek floors it, and we are gone. So it took us about 45 minutes to get to the diner gas station. Rachel is sobbing the whole way. Derek and I explained everything to them. Brittany jumps between crying, yelling, and smoking. We had to pull over because Derek got so shaken up he had to throw up. So I drove the rest of the way. I want to say that I was handling it the best. But when I look back, I think I was handling it the worst. Because I forced myself to not be upset. I felt like I had to be strong for my friends. Because I really thought it was the end for us all. I held Rachel's hand the whole way. And I told her, I love you. And there is no way I am going to let some creeps hurt you. I also told her that her mother was going to kill us. She was still crying, but she finally laughed. As we get to the diner, I call the forest services and then the police. The rangers get there first. We tell them everything. We tell them where we think we were. I wanted to go with them to make sure they found the right place, but Rachel wanted me to stay. I managed to get everyone to eat, and the police finally showed up. What assholes. They acted like we were being dramatic teenagers and said it might have just been a prank. At the risk of being in trouble, I told them, kiss my fucking ass. After the police left, the rangers called back. They found our site, and it had been trashed. Every tent had been ripped to shreds. Lovely. We finally head home. Derek and Rachel's parents are so pissed, and I convinced them to not tell my Nana because she's a little old lady and it would be bad for her health and stress her out. Rachel will never go camping again and it was a while before me and Derek went again. If there is any moral to this story here, I think it would be don't camp in the middle of nowhere. 